My name is Nancy Prince, and I'm going to go over a little bit about uh, the shading and blending and highlighting that I have in my that I put in my book. Somebody asked me right after I wrote the book. They said, "Well, when are you going to write another book?" This was like three weeks after I'd finally got my hands on the first copy. I said, "It's a bit like asking somebody who's just given birth when they're going to get pregnant again." Yeah. So, you know, I bet I said, "Let's let this settle down here a little bit before I go anywhere else." But I want to get into a little bit about how easy this is. One of the things I have to uh, kind of live with in my profession that I've chosen here is a lot of people think this is really hard to do. And it's not. It's a straight it's a zigzag stitch. So it can't be that difficult to do. If you can drop your feed dogs, that's fine. If you can't, well, there's ways around that too. So I want to kind of show you the difference between what you used to do when you would color with your daughter, your granddaughter, whatever, and what you're going to need to do when you're working with thread. Now, when you work, let me explain this here. Is that any better? Not really? Okay, well, deal with it. <laughs> Let's try that. Is that any better? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> when you're, um, when you're working with, if you're cr with your coloring or something, you butt your threads together. And that's okay when you're coloring with, because it's not that critical. But when you're working with thread and you want to get a very natural look, you have to blend these colors together. And when you blend them together, what you, the idea is what you want to try to do is so that you can't tell where one thread stops and the next thread starts. And basically, it's just an intertwining of thread. When you're working with thread, you cannot blend it like you do with paint. With paint, you can go over here to the palette, and you can come over here, and you can put up whatever color you want. But when you're working with thread, your eye has got to do all the blending for you. So this little example right here, I've blended this, and I've ended up with this. Now, a lot has to do with how well your threads play together. In class, unfortunately, we don't have the time that we need in there to be able to make samples to make sure that the thread works really well. But I think that when the student told me today, she said, the one thing I learned today in class is how important it is to get colors to go well together. And I said that, if you learn that today, I'm really, really happy about that. So once we've done all this blending and we've gotten thread the way we want it to be, this is kind of the process of the way things go. What you're going to have is you're going to have, you're going to draw your design on a piece of water soluble stabilizer. And then you're going to start going from there. Now, in this one right here, we've done a little bit on the cherries, and we've done a little bit of two different colors up here on the leaves. And here again, we're blending these colors together. Now, these two, we've got some just started here. We've almost finished here, and we've got the highlight here. And you keep going with that until it looks something like this. And here again, it's just a matter of blending one color into the next so that it looks realistic. And then this little guy right here is the final, is the final quilt on there. Now, generally when I work with um, threads, what I'm working with, I'm working with a blending color, a highlight color, and a shading color. If you look at the cherries here, and I don't know if you can tell this on the camera or not, the very first thing that I choose is my blending color because that's the core colors. That's the colors that I want to have the most on there. Now, let's look at this one here. This is a little cherry that all I did was color it. I've, I've got the colors. I've got red cherries, green leaves, and a brown branch. And that's fine, but there's no realism to them. On this one right here, this one, I've added the shading, and the shading is what gives it form. If you don't have shading in something, it has absolutely no form to it at all. Now, if you look at the leaves up here, here's the dark color on here, here's the shading on that. When you're looking at shading colors, they're the ones that take your eye into a design. Now, on this little guy right here, the little farmer, I did the same thing with him. I just colored him in. He's got all the basic colors. He's got jean colors. He's got his little top here. And then we go from there to here. The difference is on here, I've used 
the darkest color within his jeans. When I first started this, I thought that you use black and white. You use black to shade and you lose white for highlights. I found out very quickly that they were too stark and that I needed, <clears throat> excuse me, I needed something that wasn't quite as defined as that. So if you use the darkest color of whatever uh, core colors you have, that's what's going to be your shading. Now, how do you determine where your shade's going to be? Because everybody says, well, I need to be an artist to do this. No, you do not need to be an artist to do this. I'm not an artist. I don't paint, nor do I draw. I've kind of fooled around with it long enough that I've kind of got the idea of what this needs to be. Um, this, what the shading does, like I said earlier, it, it draws your eye into a design. The highlight is what gives it the spark and the bounce on there. Now, on the little butterfly here, it would be very easy just to use a couple of colors in there, but I wanted to make sure that I gave him, gave the little butterfly here some form. Uh, when you're choosing your blending colors, and your blending colors are your co core colors, which are the blues that are in here, they need to play well together. They need to be very harmonious. They need to make sure that um, when they're mixed together, they play well together, and you really can't see one from another. But it gives you it, but it, but your eye will do the blending for you so that you can actually see. Uh, it looks like it's one color in there instead of two. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Once I have the blending colors in here, I need to put the highlight colors on here. The highlights is going to be the brightest color that you see on there. And then what happens with the highlight? That tells you where the sun's coming from. So if I want to decide, okay, I'm doing a butterfly, I get to decide where the sun is coming from. On this one, I just assumed it was coming in this direction right here. So what I've done is I've used the darkest of the blues to shade, and I've used the lightest of that same color. Now sometimes if you have a color like uh, white, and you need maybe to make a, you maybe need to put a little shading on there, a little highlighting on there, uh, maybe you want to use the pale blue, or you might want to use a yellow. Uh, also, you can also use colors that are adjacent on the color wheel. And I'm not a big, I don't do use the color wheel a lot, but basically what it is, if you had like a pale orange, then you could use um, a pink or something like that on there. Just something that takes you out of that color family in order uh, to make it spark. Um, you can also use your like I said earlier, you only use a straight or a zigzag stitch. And I use a zigzag stitch most of the time. And, oops, I need to be there. I need to be there. Uh, when you use your zigzag stitch, you can do a lot with the width of that stitch. On this particular one here, and I think it's kind of hard to see up there, but on this one right here, I wanted this underneath the tree to appear like it was further away from you. So two things happen. You use a dark thread, which makes everything recede, and you use a very narrow zigzag stitch, and that also makes everything go into the distance as well. On the canopy here, the very last thread that I used was a very bright, uh, almost a lime green, and that was like my, my highlight color, and what that does is it brings it towards me. Also, I used a 4.5 millimeter, a much whiter stitch, which then allows, which looks like this is coming towards you. Um, at the end, I wanted to put some dark highlight or dark shading in here, and so I hopscotched with a zigzag stitch all the way around through here until I got the shading that I want, wanted on there. So you can use your thread not only for the color, but then you can use your stitch, the size of your stitch, to make it the way you want it to be. Now, I have some students that say, well, you know what, I don't want to go through all this stuff. I don't want to draw this. I'm not an artist. I don't want to do any of this stuff. What else can I do with thread? Well, there's a lot of other things that you can do with thread. Um, on this one right here, this was a piece of fabric that I found that I really, really liked. And I thought it was really cute. Oops, sorry. So what I did is I came in through here, and I just used my thread the lines are already there. I don't have to figure this out. The lines are there for me to do whatever I want to do with. So I made several shades of green. And when you're doing leaves, leaves aren't, all, aren't just green. They can have brown in them. They can have pale um, yellow like this one has. 
So when you're choosing your colors, just don't stick with one color family. You can bounce around all through the, the other color families. You can also, on this one right here, I found this piece that was in um, a quilt store, and I thought, well, this is really pretty. And I just used what I call thread sketching, and I just sketched the colors that were on there. Pick, uh, would you? Here we go. And if you look at that, you can say, well, I could quilt the same way. I could use, use my thread and I could quilt. I don't trust myself enough to do that. This way I can put my lines on there. Then I let put my layers together and then I can use invisible thread to go back in and quilt where I want it to quilt. So for me, it's an easier way to do that. But I love the finished look. You don't have to draw anything. You just have to have, you know, the threads that are gonna go with that. The same thing here, this is, I call this a little funky flower. What I did on this one is I found a bunch of different flowers and then I sketched over them and then I put them together like a little puzzle at the end. So there's more, more than one way to skin a cat. You don't have to just draw all this stuff. It doesn't have to be, you know, on something like this that you've drawn. Uh, I've gotten to the point that I really, really like working on somebody else's fabric. Now, there are also times, too, um, I had some students, when I first started teaching, they said, you know, we really like the thread painting, but some of it takes too long. And I said, fine, let's see what else we can come up with. So uh, I made up a few of these little things. These are little quilts. These are sketches. These just give you the idea that the design is there. This isn't the whole thing. I haven't thread painted the whole boat. This you can finish in about four hours. So this is very, very doable. Same thing with this little guy right here. It's just a sketch. It's just the idea of what it is that you're trying to do. Would you mind bringing a couple of those placemats over here? Now this one right here, this, is, this one's kind of fun. This is a photograph that I took of my two grandchildren when they were actually getting along one day at my house. <laughs> and they were sitting in the same um, swing. So I took the photograph and I took it into Photoshop Elements. And if you go into Photoshop, do any of you guys have Photoshop Elements? There's a little, if, when you go in there, there's a filter section. And what you can do is you can make it draw it for you. You go in there and you tell it to find edges. And when it does, it actually draws this out for you. And then from there, if I want to draw it myself from the drawing, I can make the changes that I want to do. So then once I did that, then I copied, I traced this on a piece of clear water-soluble stabilizer, which is this right here. And that, that's what I used for my pattern. And then I just stitched through the stabilizer and then we're ready to go. So you can do all sorts of things. One other good thing too is, um, do any of you print on fabric at home? You can find maybe a, a vacation picture or something that, that you really, really like and just embellish that with thread. Go in and play with it. Go have some fun with it. Uh, and then you can put it on your quilt or your jacket or whatever it is that you're getting ready to do. So there's more than just, I've been thread painting like this for years, but I actually love going to the thread sketching part of it. Um, this one right here is also, this actually happens to be a CD that I did, on, it's an embroidery CD that I did about eight or nine months ago. And this way, you just get, again, you get the idea of the design that's on here. Vienna, would you please? <laughs> and while you, while you may not like embroidery, you don't want to do embroidery, this is something uh, that you could certainly do by yourself without the aid of an embroidery machine. And here again, you're gonna draw your design on this piece of stabilizer, put your fabric underneath it in two pieces. This is, this goes on the bottom. This is water soluble stabilizer. This goes on the bottom of underneath your fabric. And this is a water, a water soluble stabilizer as well. And you hoop it up and off you go. On your hoops, if you're working at home or wanna give this a try, use a six inch hoop. You don't need anything any bigger than a six inch hoop when you're thread painting. Uh, I had a lady that came to class one day and she had a 12 inch hoop. Now, first of all, the projects I have are way too small for that. And she said, well, I don't want to have to keep moving the hoop. 
The problem is the bigger the surface inside that hoop, the more distortion you're going to get. The smaller the hoop, the less distortion that you're going to get. Okay? All right, I think, I think we had, what, 10, 15 minutes that we could do here? I think that kind of takes care of, I have totally made a mess up here. Um, you want to hold this one? This is one that I did a number of years ago. Um, prolonging for the past. And I tell everybody in the class, I said, it's not a quilt in the day. <laughs> it's not something that you're going to quilt in a day. I feel like I really hurried through this, and I apologize for this. I think I'm like short of brain dead right now. Um, but I do appreciate your coming. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. I do have some books up here if you're interested. Um, I have some postcards. Yes. When you look at that quilt, there's four little trees in the center. Those three, those four trees were thread painted right onto the fabric. Everything else was put on there after it was quilted, binded, bordered, labeled. In other words, that's all done. And then these go on. Because uh, if you go ahead and like on the cart, if you put the cart on there and quilt to it, every time you get here, you bump, you bump, you bump, you bump. And then you have a silhouette on the back of where you couldn't quilt through. Plus it gives you a nice solid surface underneath there in which to put your design on. So I kind of like that one. That one's kind of going to go home with me. Yes. Did I draw the... Yeah, I quilted it first. Is that your question? And then I put it. Then I put this on top of the quilting. Is that? Did you know where it was going to be? Well, before you, did you have a place? Did I know where the the horse was going to go before I put it on? Yes, it's all drawn out. I draw out all. I did one quilt without drawing it out, and it was a huge mistake. Uh, so uh, everything gets drawn to where I want it to go. That doesn't mean I'm not going to change or add some things as I go. Uh, but no, it's much better to go ahead and and draw it out first. Yes. Nancy, where can you get the wash away stuff that you use? Because I haven't been able to find it. What kind of sewing machine do you have? None right now. Okay. I just sold mine because I want to upgrade. I want a Bernina. <laughs> All right. This actually happens to be, this is made by OESD and Bernina owns OESD. Oh, okay. So any Bernina store will have this. Oh, okay. If you have a Fox dealership or a FOF machine, they have one called Aqua Magic. Floriani makes one called Wet and Gone. Uh, they're all basically the same. And this is what goes underneath the fabric to support the fabric. This right here is made by Superior Threads. This is what I draw. This is what I'm drawing on, or tracing on. It's clear, so I can see, you know, I can lay this over whatever I'm getting ready to trace off, and it's really, really easy to see what's on there. When I first, the very, when I first started this, I thought that what I had in my brain would go to here, and it didn't. But if you draw it on here, then I know exactly, it's like this, I know exactly where I've got to go. Yeah, if I'm working off the quilt, like most of the designs were on the other one, uh, I have the drawn design on top, I've got two pieces of tulle in the center, and I, this is also the same white stabilizer on the back. If I'm working on fabric, I had that out here a minute ago. I'm not sure what I did with it. If I'm working on fabric, on the top, I've got the drawing. In the center, I've got the fabric. And on the bottom, I've got two pieces of this. It's stabilized, stabilized, stabilized. If you don't stabilize it correctly, you're going to have a mess. If you don't hoop it up, hoop it too, you'll have a mess. So it's really, really, really a lot of fun. Um, Yeah, what I do. What I do is I, if once I'm done, I cut away the excess stabilizer. If I'm not answering your question, let me know. And then I, I rinse all the gooey out because this stuff, when it breaks down, it's like water cement. Uh, water cement. <laughs> <laughs> like rubber cement. 
Uh, it's very gooey, so you just let it wash it off of there, and then once the goo's gone, uh, then I'm going to soak it. And when I soak it, it'll, it removes the stabilizer that's caught between the threads. Then I'm going to clean it up, and then it's going to go on the quilt when I'm done. Did that answer your question? It's kind of hard to hear from here. If not, grab me down here. I'm not going anywhere. Your machine has to stay in it on your quilted background. <sighs> Give me that. Like you your the horse. Piece the horse the you did it separate. The piece was quilted underneath. You applicate the horse. Yes, I put a couple of, thank you. I put a couple of drop, whops, <laughs> couple of drops. <laughs> I have, I have, it's like, eh. Uh. I put a couple of drops of water soluble glue on the back of the design, put it up there, pretend like it's here, let it dry, and then I use invisible thread on the top and whatever I've quilted it with on the bottom, and I just lightly tack it going around the outside edge, and that's what holds it on there. And you will never see that stitch that's on there at all. So I think I totally confused everybody because I know I'm totally confused. What invisible thread is your favorite? I like the monopoly is made by Superior Threads. It's, uh, it's a polyester thread. It's not that old nylon thread that we all used to hate. It's a much, it's a far but superior product. It will be available again until the end of the year. I just checked with Superior. And uh, of course I'm running out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've had trouble getting the man getting manufacturers. And what kind of thread do you use in your? I use a 40 weight polyester. Or you can use rayon also. Uh, it's got a nice sheen to it. It's a little bit heavier than the 50 weight cotton that you guys piece with. Um, if you look on the side of the thread, there's a number. The lower that number, the thicker the thread. The higher the number, obviously, the thinner the thread. So, Also in these designs, even though I have 40 weight, that doesn't mean I'm limited to 40 weight thread. Uh, on the winter quilt that was up here a minute ago, the dog's teeth were only an eighth of an inch tall, and I used silk thread. I needed enough time to go in and thread paint the teeth in, and with the 40 weight thread, it's too heavy. You just get big blobs of thread. So I use all weights of thread on most of the designs that I do because I get a much better look that way. Because they have little tiny teeth. <laughs> and around the horse's mouth, too, I had the same problem. I needed detail. Anytime you need detail in something, you've got to go to a much thinner thread. Okay?